Hello ladies and gentlemen, and today I'm going to talk about the big rundown of the whole entire script. This video is going to be very, very long, so if you actually want to know what happened in a Spider-Man 1994 movie, or what it could have been, stay right here, web your playlist down, and just listen up. As for the rest of you, there will be lots and lots of other videos out there that will be cut versions of this where I talk about the few things they have, the few weird things they did, and everything else. So, sit back, relax, and here we go. So, first things first is we've got to start with the intro. It's an interesting intro, and it's so director-like. It's just so James Cameron, I guess, in quotations. The fact that they just made it very, 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 very... It's kind of like exactly what happened with Sam Raimi. I guess this is a familiar thing, too, is that Sam Raimi actually did kind of the same thing. But he hinted at it a little bit, you know, when he actually showed Spider-Man in the intro and he was walking around the webs and everything. This is kind of the same exact thing that would have happened in this movie, but a little bit different. It would have panned out and showed his shoulder, panned out and showed his... Yeah, so it's lots of things that would have happened. So, Sam Raimi like. The World Trade Center was featured here. World Trade Center got destroyed in 2001 for people who don't know. But yeah, the World Trade Center actually was featured in this movie, and this movie would have been pulled in 2001 for a long while, because the World Trade Center is a touchy subject. It was just a few years ago they decided to actually say it's okay to show the World Trade Center again. So, I guess a few years ago, this 1994 movie would be able to be shown again. Well anyways, so Spider-Man gives a narration just like what happened in the Sam Raimi movies. It also seems like there is not going to be an origin story in this. Yeah, oh wait, well it seems like it, but what happened is that in the beginning of the movie, he was Spider-Man, already seen as Spider-Man, and he was just talking a little bit. At first, I thought there wasn't going to be an origin story, but you'll get it, you'll see what happens. So anyway, Spider-Man actually bought a newspaper, and it was kind of funny how it worked. There was mentioning of how to spell his name and I think it was the Daily Bugle they couldn't actually understand how to spell his name so yeah they actually showed that it's Spider-Man not Spider-Man so there should be a dash between it or the space between it not all together so that was kind of cool so they cut from Spider-Man to Peter Parker in this movie he is 17 years old and we first see him zip popping that's right we already get the regular, actual teen-like thing where he actually is popping a zit. And my mistake on there is no origin because there is an origin. And they actually go far enough to say what happened to his parents. They established that his parents died in a plane crash when he was six years old. And of course it shows inner drama about his parents. Just the fact that he's like, if I was a good boy, would have they stayed and stuff like that. Another thing they changed is that Peter actually was born in Maryland. And he was in Maryland from birth all the way to six years old. He now lives in Flushing, New York City. So he goes to Forest Hill High School or Forest Hill School or Forest Hill, which is a school in a high income neighborhood. And of course, you know, this is the 90s. So they had to establish the whole MTV Nation atmosphere there. So he's basically an outcast, he's not popular, he's a lonely, he's unhappy, he finds peace in his studies. And this is just basically developing Peter's character, that's what all happened in it. For him, he actually says bonehead a lot. He said it maybe two or three times in this whole entire movie, but at first it seems like it was going to be bonehead, 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 but not really. For some reason, for some reason, this is what comic book cast talked about a little bit, is for some reason, they had to mention he was a virgin. Yeah, for some reason, he had to mention that he was a virgin, and yeah, whatever. So, here's the messed up part about the movie that I do have to say is kind of weird, is that in the movie, or in the script, it said, Peter doesn't have friends. 
And then later on, it retcons that and says Peter does have friends. Straight A student friends. But you just said he didn't have any friends. You just said he was lonely, unhappy and stuff. But you now just said he does have friends, which is like, okay. Anyways, that day at school, Peter, we see Peter with his friends who are mostly straight A student misfit types like himself. I think that was a quote from the actual movie. He loves biology and now enter Mary Jane. She needs to pass with an A so she can graduate and she gets a promised car. So they promise her a car if she graduates. Also, her girlfriends, she actually has friends that are girls. They are usually the gal pal types. What they did when they were looking at Peter was looked and smirked because, well, yeah, Peter. So they made Peter nerdy to the max in this movie. Yeah, they definitely made Peter nerdy to the max. We got Flash Thompson, but his name is not Flash Thompson. It's not Eugene Thompson. Flash is actually named Nathaniel McCreary, which is actually MJ's current boyfriend. He's a senior on the football team, and he's the head of the gymnastic team. Don't ask me why. I think in the 90s, gymnastics was awesome. I mean, look at what happened with Power Rangers. Mario Morphin Power Rangers. You had Kimberly who did gymnastics. You had Billy who did gymnastics. So it was kind of a popular thing in the 90s, I suppose. He's also a tennis snob and he drives a Porsche. Yeah, rich, very rich, huh? Peter takes the bus due to the low funds. Of course, this sounds familiar because this actually happened to Sam Raimi, didn't it? The fact that he actually had to take the bus. Of course, in Amazing Spider-Man, we didn't really understand what exactly did... How did he get to school? I think they never actually even talked about how he got to school. Huh. Oh, well. Anyways, I think there's some foreshadowing going on. There's something that happened that was foreshadowing what would happen next. I kind of forgot what was it. So, so Peter oscillates between despising... Oh. Okay, yeah, this is a quote from the movie. Peter oscillates from between despising her and fantasizing about saving her from a burning building so she will eternally be grateful to him and maybe even kiss him. This is actually a quote from the movie itself. So Flash is a jerk like usual and he has jock friends. He has a pool and a tennis court at his house. And this is what Peter says to get out of going with Flash and MJ. He has an honor student seminar as in a genetics lab, one of the nation's leading research programs on recombinant DNA and gene therapy. Well, there he goes. So he goes there. There's restricted areas and there's just the genetic blah, blah talk and also fruit flies were there. And I was like, a fruit fly? Really? Peter asked to take photos. Doesn't that sound familiar? That sounds familiar from Sam Raimi, doesn't it? So Peter asked to take photos. He does take photos. But the group just leaves him behind. Which is weird. The group just straight up leaves him behind. The other weird part was just the fact of with the spiders. Again, this is Sam Raimi-like. This is Sam Raimi-like. The fact that they're like, yeah, we have some spiders, and it's like, one's missing. And it's like, wait, what? So, <laughs> again, sounds so reminiscent to what happened in Sam Raimi's script, doesn't it? Well, movie, actually. So, he gets bit by the spider. He kills it. He actually smacks it on his fist, kills it, and then hurries with the group. So, then they cut to the subway when he's taking it home. Does that sound familiar? That's Amazing Spider-Man. That's so Amazing Spider-Man. So for right now, there's like many points where I actually will point out and say, so they took it from Amazing Spider-Man or so, yeah, so it looks like this script actually has been picked out a little bit. Some of it, they're like, yeah, this seems good. This seems good. This seems good. So it's like, Amazing that they might actually come back to this script to look for lots of things to put in the next Spider-Man movie or at least if they want to retell it again 
they have an interesting thing do they're doing here. The hand is red and swollen, and he's he's kind of dry in the mouth, and he's sweating as well. So when he gets home, he has blurry vision, and he avoids Aunt May, and then collapse on a floor after taking off his clothes, of course. But doesn't it sound familiar? This sounds so familiar. This is Sam Raimi's. The fact that he's... Instead of actually just avoiding Aunt May, he actually said, I had a bite, I'm going to go lay down. And in Sam Raimi's, he took off his glasses, he took off his shirt, and then he collapsed on the floor, pulling the blanket over him. In this version, he actually just takes off all his clothes. So not only his shirt is off, but his pants is off too. And his shoes, and his socks. And he actually doesn't even have... A blanket over him either so so as you can see they went really drastic in this version but as Sam Raimi all they did was just basically but it gets cooler yeah this actually does get cooler well anyways he's wrecked by a compulsive tremor like a seizure he plunges into a yeah, psychotropic state an abyss of dark visions which yawns behind him he falls into salestrum barded by hallucinatory manifestations this is actually a quote from the script disturbing images of webs from a pod pov as if crawling over them glistening eyes in the dark suddenly predatory lunges Predator struggling hopelessly to escape. A David Lynch, a David Lynch bio horror montage of Spider World. Shadowy images of the rooftops crawling over buildings and fences, leaping through the dark air. This is all from the script. Yep, quotes from the script because it was so much, so much to deal with. So I just, yeah, you're gonna hear lots of quotes I'm going to say from the script. And most likely it'll be on screen as well. So, oh my, here we go. He wakes up on a 50-foot tower and he is in his own underwear. He screams. Yeah, and notice he continues to scream. If you guys were like so angry or so mocking about the whole Tobey Maguire and he cries... Well, in this version, you almost likely will mock the fact that Spider-Man screams. He has screams lots of times in this movie. So, yeah. Take notice of that. The interesting part is that as he screams, there is no one who actually gives attention, looks up, and just see what's going on. No one looks up to see him. So, what he does now is he makes a dash home. And he makes sure that he's not seen. So, yeah, it's like everyone's nightmare. The fact that they're in their underwear and they have to run. They have to run home before anyone actually sees them. So, he does make it home unseen. And he comes back home and goes into the basement and he shakes in a corner. He's actually in fetal position in a corner because of what just happened. So spiders are present, hinting at the bug bite, and then there's some confusing crap. Yeah, it's really confusing. So, yeah, so this is all confusing because what it said in the script is that he returned home and went into the basement. But then all of a sudden, in a few little bit of paragraphs later, it says he comes home after dark saying he was stunning. So I guess maybe he went back home in the basement and then after that he shook it off he put his clothes on and then he actually went home or something i don't know i have no idea maybe it's not even his basement maybe it's just someone else's basement he looked for clothes he found clothes and then he returned home i don't even know but anyways it says that he was studying he says he was studying they check on him but he covered it up he went to the bathroom and he noticed he can see without his glasses and enters in the glasses no glasses scene which this happened before didn't it it has happened before with sam raimi 
without all the horrible, not all the messed up stuff that happened. Yeah, this is, you guys remember Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, so I don't have to actually tell you what happened in that. As for Amazing Spider-Man, we never really got the thing of he actually got better eyesight, did we? I don't think so. Yeah, they never really hinted at the fact that his eyesight got better. Apparently, he had anopia. I don't know how to say it. But anyways, he had this disease. Apparently, they established that he had this disease. But the disease got cured because of the spider bite. And later that night, he had a dream of spiders yet again. This time, rather than a dark roaming horror of confusing, of confusion, it's disjointed images it is more refined, an aerial ballet of eerie grace, the weaving of an orb web from the spider's point of view, shimmering geometry in cold black space. That's from the script. The next day, it was the sheets that stuck to him. Apparently, it was the webbing. So, they have organic it is organic and this scene this scene right here is so innuendo it's not even funny of course this also was a little bit familiar but it becomes familiar later this part we didn't get to see this part we didn't need to see but anyways this is totally innuendo and here is what the script says and most likely after i read it you'll say holy frick this is funny along with so wrong Something is causing the sheets to stick to him. He lifts it, revealing a sticky white mass completely covering him, gluing him to his bedding. There you go. Of course, I wrote this last part. I added this last part so everyone won't say, oh my gosh. It is some silky substance webbing him into the sh covers. Oh wait, that's not even, that's not even better. Sorry. But yeah, you see how messed up this is, right? It's, it's messed up. It really is messed up. Anyways, next up is... So, he actually webbed himself in the face and he screams. This is the second time he screams. Atme comes and says... Atme comes to check on him and he says he's practicing for a school play. <laughs> yeah. Now, oh, I guess, yeah, I still have to wait. Because this is not the part. This is not the point of Ord part where he actually does do something that's familiar. He freaks out of the spinnerets, and he caught spinnerets that he has on his arms. Well, actually, not arms and his wrists. So Kafka's metamorphosis is mentioned. So Peter runs away, and he trains, discovering his power. He's able to jump, or he actually jumps 50 feet in the air. Again, he yells. Now he's stuck on a wall of a building. And this is where it is a little bit of a funny part. It's that Peter told a kid that was riding a bike to call 911. And instead of the kid saying anything, he just biked away. So anyways, Peter falls to the ground and he lands on his hands and feet. So it shows that he is strong and he has agility. His agility is even superhuman than ever. He grows excited now. Yeah, he's growing excited. He uses fingers trying to trying to figure out how to properly shoot webs or professionally shoot webs. And he does it and he swings back and forth from a tree branch. I think, yeah, this part where he actually professionally shoots webs, I think there's another part where I actually will say it's familiar. So we now go back to school. He looks around and thinks to himself, this is a secret. Plus, he actually thinks to himself that they'll think he's a freak if he even mentions it. So in biology, he wants to do a project on spiders. Of course, MJ is kind of grossed out by it, but he wants to do it just to learn more about himself. So Peter practiced web shooting in a junkyard. In the end, it's a total mess. Now, this is where I talk about the whole thing that happened with Sam Raimi the fact of in his room he started webbing things he started webbing a lamp start webbing a Dr. Pepper can so yeah this this is a familiar part but we actually get to have a junkyard actually covered in webs now that would be kind of cool to see that would be kind of cool 
He drinks milk and he eats. He eats so much. And this is where I'm like, okay, this is where it's familiar in Amazing Spider-Man. The fact that in Amazing Spider-Man, he grabbed lots and lots of food, including a microwave macaroni. And it's not even warm. But he took a lot of food and went upstairs. In this one, you have Aunt May who is happy of his appetite. She is happy he's eating. That's good. The other one, you had both of them being freaked out saying, did he just take me? Yeah, so, yeah, you guys know what happened to Amazing Spider-Man. Anyways, he was doing his homework, but then he decided to jump houses and web sling. And he later reflects again on the change that's happening. And here is a nice little quote from the script. Hopefully this will be seen correctly as a metamorphosis of puberty and awakening of primal drives. Everybody goes through this growing awareness that powerful forces are driving them behind their supposedly rational consciousness. This is actually a note from the director. Anyways, he continues to leap through the night, honing his skills, pushing his powers all the way to the point. And of course, I do have to mention, in this script, the director is writing stuff too to explain a few things, just like that snippet I just read. So he learns to use the night as cover, and he's able to tell people now. So he goes to MJ's house to see her stripped to her panties and then put a shirt on so they said that he actually watched her strip so i guess he might have actually saw her and it would actually be frontal nudity the fact that she's not wearing a bra or a shirt so we actually would get to see that but on the other hand i think it most likely she had a bra and panties on and then she put on a shirt i don't know you tell me this is what the script says she turns off the light and thinks she is unobserved she strips off her clothes she slips into the bed in just her panties and a t-shirt peter loses concentration and falls in the rose bushes peter falls asleep in class his grades are slipping see that was kind of the funny part the fact that he lost concentration and fell in the rose bushes that was kind of funny but of course as you can see peter is falling asleep now now, this is, comes to the point of where we never seen it ever in Spider-Man. Is that, well, actually, no. We saw it once in Spider-Man. In Amazing Spider-Man, they said, well, it, was, it happened before. We're not going to do this again. Even though they could have just took this and we would have been okay with it. Even though this, this makes it stupid. This makes super stupid in the Amazing Spider-Man movie because they were going for a grittier thing. So this would actually made it look more stupid. Anyways, now he thinks about how he can make money by using this power. So he tries to figure out a name he wants to go by and he one of them was Man Spider. Nice, that was funny. So he decided to become a street performer. He has a stocking mask and he wears all black. He's in between a mime and a drummer who is drumming on pails. So he is he gets hired for a birthday party for 50 bucks. But the person said he needs a better costume. So in class he doodled costume ideas. In Spider-Man, we did get something like that. The fact that he did the same thing. He wanted to impress MJ with a car. So he looks for a car. He finds a car for I think $29.98 and he found a wrestling ad that says can you beat someone within three minutes get three thousand dollars so he decides to create a costume so he makes a costume ideas he's trying to figure out all that stuff you already seen spider-man so you know what happens even though I do have to admit one of the costumes he made that he ditched he ditched was kind of cool in Amazing Spider-Man, we get hints from, not deleted scenes, but it's like, there's just some things that they show us, like what was in Peter's book bag, and he had lots of sketches. Yeah, so, he did do that, it's just that we never actually got to see him actually do that in the movie. It was done off screen. So, same ideas, they all actually doodled to figure out costume ideas. And then later on, we get Peter making a costume. 
What he does is buy Lacroix dance skin that is red and blue, and he has big old jack o' lantern eyes. So yeah, he found jack o' lantern eyes and put those on his stocking cap, and that's how Spider Man looks. He looks like yeah, so that's like his pre before Spider Man. But anyways, he decided to also have some old watch bands and cigarette lighters. And made those look like web shooters. So people think he's actually shooting webs out of these. Instead of actually shooting webs all by himself. So yeah. It's a nod. So people actually can think he is doing it. Yeah. So that's a nod to web shooters right there. He practices in the mirror. And he also do some poses. And he changes his voice so he can actually make sure he can disguise himself. And here is what we got from, this is what it says in the script. Spider-Man is born out of Peter the boy. Spider-Man is everything Peter is not. Confident, cocky, physical, powerful, smooth, ready with a snappy one-liner. We see long repressed aspirations or aspects of Peter coming out, giving birth, giving form and substance behind the mask. I think this was actually the director's note yet again. But here's the funny part is that Aunt May interrupts Peter and she thinks again that this is for the play. I don't think she actually sees, P she doesn't actually see Peter in the costume. So that's one thing. It's like, again, the door is kind of closed or he's holding the door a little bit so she can't see kind of like what happened in Spider-Man. But anyways, Spider-Man becomes a public phenom. 50 bucks ups for upscale's parties and etc. He gets booked on a variety show. It's kind of a gong show. And of course he lies about the webbing. The fact that he has it he has a special mix to create the webbing. But of course he has spinnerets in this version. So And then we have someone who is watching him. And then you have so many TVs. And the TVs are actually on voice command. Yeah, of course, the director was like, yeah, this is our big, heavy head honcho here. And that's what he had in his notes and stuff like that. So we cut from him. And then we cut to Spider-Man. Then we cut to reveal. And we find out that it is Carlton Strand. Yeah, Carlton Strand. And he is a super-powered industrialist. And this is what wikipedia said about him and he is in his 40s that's what i think that's what the director said the director said he wants him to be in his 40s and of course this is your electro for anyone who doesn't know of course he is wearing a very expensive custom tailored suit oh this is what this is what the script says he is wearing a very expensive custom tailored suit his hair slipped back very GQ. His nails are manicured. His watch is platinum. He is an image of a vast wealth attained, not inherited. And then we have Boyd, which is Electro's henchman. And he tells Boyd to find out all about Spider Man. That is his task. And then we get a flashback, our first flashback. We flash back to 10 years ago, which most likely means 1984, 1985. So we get, we get Carl's origin. So he was actually in New Mexico desert and he was getting chased by a cops in a stolen Mercury that he also robbed. And he actually robbed a bank too. And there was a massive gunfight. He runs into a lightning field house. If you guys don't remember, in Spider-Man 3, we had the same exact thing with Flint Marco. Except, okay, so in this version, there was no fences or anything. Someone could just straight up run into the lightning field house. In Spider-Man 3, there was a fence, and that's what Flint Marco did. He climbed a fence, and then he fell right into... Nice to mention that this is the first cuss word we get. You finally see the first cuss word, and the first cuss word is the S word. Anyways, there is an electrical vortex. The police just watch the horrifying scene, 
and he comes to and activates a truck. Yeah, so he was shocked to oblivion, and then he was able to crawl away from that, and then the next day, he was trying to actually make a truck work. He zapped it, and the truck actually decided to activate. One zap, and he got the truck working. And then we have weeks later. Carl is back. He made his appearance to all his acquaintances. He mentions that he was set up. He intimidates them. He zaps the leader. And then he revives them saying, clear. You see, that was a funny joke. That was kind of funny. He tries, they try to shoot him. He pins all of them with his lightning. The leader is left. And it turns out that the leader actually was the one who set him up. So apparently he also talks and says he can sense electrical energies. He sees pulsing webs of electrical fields. That sounds familiar from Amazing Spider-Man 2. That's what they did as well. That's what Electro saw. So, yep. Something they took from the script, didn't they? And this is what the script says because it's better to read from the script than actually paraphrase it. Laying his hand on a telephone wire, he can hear the conversation. By touching a computer, he can download the data from its hard drive. His brain itself has been energized and is now able to follow and analyze all these signals. The world is a pulsing circulatory system of electrical and electromagnetic currents and waves. The real power, he says, is not force but information then force that is what he said that was in the script i don't know how to explain how can he download a computer file i don't know i don't know it's 1994 so you have discs you have regular floppy disks which means that's even worse that's even worse to explain anyway he kills the leaders then free the others and now they are doing big time crimes. And this is what the script says. He takes the resources of the two bit crime syndicate and takes them legit. Then uses his ability to steal and manipulate data. He builds them into a mega player. He is utterly ruthless, brilliant, feared, and almost magical in a way he knows everything that is going on. Anyone that stands in his way seems to, to conveniently die of a heart attack. And then we have Cordelia. And Cordelia is actually his, well, I'll say girlfriend, but you know, bad guys don't really truly have girlfriends. This is just a girl he's with. She is wearing something sexy for him, and it's a rubber suit, a rubber wetsuit. Oh, man. Shh. So, this is one thing that is really, really messed up, is the fact that anyone he touches, even if he didn't mean to, he electrocutes them. So, she actually, he actually electrocuted her, and yeah, there's lots of sexual innuendo stuff too. The fact that he actually took his hand and put it inside the wetsuit itself and started stroking her. So, yeah. There's another thing that everyone's like, oh my god. It's a bit more sexy, it was a bit more adult rated, but he didn't pull him down, he just put his hand in there. Anyways, comes the next one. The S word. This is the second cuss word. It's the S word. So anyways, he revives her and then we go back to Peter. So Peter is slipping in school, only biology has his attention. MJ thinks he's a geek. So, Peter actually talks about the beauty of spiders, which is very, very familiar if you guys know the Sam Raimi movie. In the Sam Raimi movie, Peter actually tries to give some information to MJ. Actually, no, that wasn't M. Yeah. So, he gives the information to Harry, and Harry tells it to MJ. <laughs> oh, man. But it's close. It's close. And then he talks about the spider moms. The fact that spiders are very, very good moms. She's grossed out by it, but she starts to like him, actually. And then we get Flash, who ambushes Peter while he was walking with MJ. Flash basically 
ridicules him and then after that started to threaten him and peter actually stands strong in this he actually is standing strong so flash now starts to argue with mj and then here is the thing that i'm like dude if this movie was even made in if this movie was actually made lots of people would so i mean if you had an uproar in the whole hank pym slapping janet van dyme now here comes something that most likely in the 90s would have actually caused an uproar and this this is not actually the quote this is just something i basically wrote flash argues with mj he slapped her he slapped her and peter is outraged yes again i said it he actually slapped her flash slapped mj well, anyways, so what happens is at night, Peter waits for Flash. He confronts him in disguise, of course, and Flash hits him thinking he's a robber. Peter slaps him two times, then punches him 10 feet in the air, or 10 feet away, then beats Flash with his Porsche. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable, huh? The after F Flash faints, the car is smashed into bits of by a signpost then peter runs away he beats up the car to not kill him yeah so he was actually going to kill flash but decides to beat and destroy his car instead so peter now begins to think that the powers brings out the worst in him so he rushes in beating flash and then starts to prowl the streets and he decides to change in the subway's bathroom well restroom he was late coming home so he snuck in at 2 a.m in the morning uncle ben was waiting for him actually in his bedroom he was waiting for him as you can see spider-man is active uncle ben is not dead yet isn't that crazy or what so yeah he's not dead yet so anyways here is what the script had to say about this whole thing that happens between uncle ben and peter I know I'm not very good at the father thing, Pete. You came in my life 20 years past my prime time. And I know you're wrestling with things now that I can't help you with much. I was your age once. I know it's hard to imagine. And it was the most painful, confusing time of my whole life. I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers for you. But I want you to know we're here for you, May and I. You can talk to us. If you're having problems, we'll understand. That is what Uncle Ben actually told Peter. Peter thinks to himself and then thanks Uncle Ben. And well, Ben feels like he failed in that talk. He failed in the discussion. So Peter reflects to himself on being Spider-Man. Then after that, a few bits later, Spider-Man is on the prowl again. He's doing his first act of justice, stopping a husband, a drunk husband, beating his wife. This is the second time where you actually have a girl getting beaten by a guy. So the lady, so he actually does it. He stops the husband and actually beats the husband up a little bit. But the freaking wife, the lady was like, leave my husband alone. And then it gets worse. The fact that the couple started beating on Spider-Man. What the heck? Yeah, that's a real total what the heck on that. <laughs> well, anyways, so he decides to just go and spy on Mary Jane, which we, it turns out her parents are very abusive. So then we get Peter as spider-man is on the show again he makes his entrance coming from the ceiling which is very very cool he meets cordelia and she gives him a note from someone and we know who that someone is carl actually wants him to meet yeah they want to meet he wants to meet him so he tries to follow cordelia but boyd steps in boyd catches him and yeah this is where we find out that boyd is sandman so we have round one of Sandman versus Spider-Man, and Sandman has white sand, unlike what happened in Spider-Man 3. There was a little teeny tiny fight going on, 
and it ends with Sandman leaving his coat and hat eerily laughing. Peter retrieves his clothes and goes. And then we get to have this of what happens when Peter goes on TV shows. The TV shows won't pay him, so he actually had to get an agent to cash it for him. And he has Uncle Ben driving him to the booking agency. And here is what happens. Here is in the script exactly what you'll see from it. Peter goes in to collect his money and the guy is broke out of business. The guy tells him to beat it. And this is what, in quotations, this is what they call him, sleazy agent. Go ahead. You want to call the cops? Call them. I'm sure they'll be happy to press charges for you. The second you take off the stupid mask and show some ID. So, yeah, so basically what he does is he wants to hide his identity to spare him and his family. Because the family will be laughed at or actually grossed at or looked upon because they'll say he's a freak. And here is the second one. Here is the second part from the script that you might want to hear. Robbery occurs. A guy in a ski mask and a cobra tattoo. I'm shocked that Amazing Spider-Man doesn't actually take that. Yeah, I'm shocked that they didn't actually just make him have a cobra tattoo on. Instead, it's a star, but whatever. The third... The thief runs past him and down the stairs. A security guard runs up. A fat guy who doesn't, doesn't have a chance of catching the criminal. He recognizes the Spider-Man costume and tells Peter to go get the guy because he can't. Peter dejects and pissed, pissed off shrugs. And Spider-Man says this, it's not my job. He changes and returns to Uncle Ben at the parking lot, but he finds Uncle Ben surrounded by a crowd. Familiar, isn't it? And he died there. Again, that's familiar. That's from the first Spider-Man movie. So it's kind of messed up that there's a big, huge coincidence on this. Well, anyways, Peter is hell-bent on finding the killer, and it, he eventually finds him in a warehouse. The guy laughs when he sees Spider-Man. And this is what the killer says, and I swear, chances are, nowadays, people will say, that's messed up. That sounds horribly wrong. This is what the killer says. Well, the fag in tights. We keep bumping into each other. That's right. He said the fag in tights. Yep, he actually said that. Not me putting in words. He actually said that. But anyways, Peter dodges bullets and then pins the guy. There is a flashback and realization, just like what happened in Amazing Spider- Well, actually, Amazing Spider-Man. He never caught him. And Spider-Man. After letting his anger go, he webs up the bad guy. He takes the bad guy to the cops, and the cops think he's some wacko. The killer tries to get free, and the cops handcuff Spider-Man. Peter gets free by force and cusses as he leaves because it's like, yeah, they didn't even ID the guy. Yeah, they didn't even look at the guy and say, hey, wait, yo, look, this is the guy that we want. This is the guy that killed that man. Instead, no, they were like, oh, there's a guy in some costume. He's some wacko. Let's handcuff them, take him to jail, and leave the guy that he webbed up behind. Yeah, that kind of sounds like stupid movie cops to me. Well, anyways, we have J. Jonah Jameson, who owns a TV station. And he reports that two cops were assaulted by a guy named Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, so Peter becomes a crime fighter. Becomes a force to be feared. Again, notice. Uncle Ben. It took this long for Uncle Ben to actually get killed. And that sounds horrible. But in the other movies, Uncle Ben is killed very quickly. Yeah, it's like, it doesn't take long for Uncle Ben to get killed. As for this Uncle Ben, it seems to me that either it's equal to the amount of time, or technically it seems that this is halfway through the movie. Anyways, so this is the third time the S word is said. This is the third cuss word in the movie. So the two cops are beating a guy. Just beating up a guy. Spider-Man stops them, and now he's a wanted criminal. Due to being wanted, there is no more cash flow for him. 
So Peter, again, is lonely. He's now persecuted and also misunderstood. So he might have spent days without using his powers. Yeah, so this time around, we have Spider-Man, who actually decided not to be Spider-Man due to the fact of he's a wanted criminal. In Spider-Man 2, I think, he was losing his powers and decided to make a choice of being Spider-Man and not being Spider-Man. It's not the fact of he still has his powers. It's the fact that he was losing his powers. Anyways, we have, oh yeah, and this is actually from the script itself. This all is from the script. J. Jonah Jameson using the media shades the story, creating a threat, going for the dark side, peddling fear, fear the spider, which lurks in the dark. And fear sells. Jameson is getting ratings. It's a good story. And he is he's going to work it as long as he can. At the same time, in some neighborhoods, he is a local legend. Crime is down and the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man is a welcome sight. And everybody wants to claim him. And here's even more. Yeah, here is even more stuff from the actual script. Black kids think he's black. Nope, he's not black yet. Yeah, you just gotta wait how many years? 18 years? Yeah, you have to wait 18 years or wait 15 years and Miles Morales will hit the scene. White kids think he's white. Hispanics think he's Hispanic and etc. etc. Spider-Man, no, no, he actually says Spidey-Man. Yeah, it says Spidey-Man ain't no white dude. He's too down. What I'm saying, you see his moves, he's definitely a brother. No, go home. My brother knows a guy that talks to him once, man. Italian says he's Italian. Gays think he's gay. I'm not I'm not putting words in their mouth. They actually said gays think he's gay. So yeah, as you can see. <laughs> There's some fun stuff right here. Yeah, there's some fun stuff. This actually would have been a funny movie, especially if they could actually put Miles Morales into this very soon. And the fact of the third comic of Miles Morales, they could have the same Fireman or someone saying, see, I told you Spider-Man was black, which he did say that. He did say that, but this movie would actually gave him even more something funny to actually say. It could actually have been a nod, but right now it's just a mere coincidence. Anyways, Peter finds out that MJ is a big Spider-Man fan. So this is what she says about him. He is mysterious and romantic, someone with courage and conviction. And she relates to his need for a mask to keep his inner self private. So Peter follows her to her private place. As she walks, some punks follow and try to say something. For people who don't recognize this, this is technically just like what happened in the original Spider-Man movie. The fact of MJ was walking into a dark alley for some reason to go home. And then you had three dudes who were like, let's get her. Was it three dudes? I think it was three, maybe even four. So Peter actually changed into his costume up. You guys saw Spider-Man. I don't need to tell you what happened. Well, anyways, they were dragging her to the junkyard and Spider-Man saves her. And this is what Spider-Man says to the punks. If you worthless chunks of vomit show your face here again, I'll decorate my Christmas tree with your intestines. Got it? Yeah. Yeah, where was that in Amazing Spider-Man? It's like, if you guys want it gritty, it looks like this right here is one that you should have said. This is one of those that's like, yeah, Amazing Spider-Man should have stole that. They should have stole that. Well, anyway, Spider-Man gives her a lift to a steel globe of a fair. And then he kisses her through the mask in the moonlight. Later on, Peter actually goes to Strand and Cordelia. And Boyd was there too. And this is what they had to say in the script. Boyd apparently was a low-paid maintenance man at a, a big military research project having something to do with SDI. They were experimenting with a quantum physics effect called bilocation. They thought they could find tunnels in the fabric of space and transpose matter into matter between the two ends of a tunnel. Essentially teleportation. And 
this would be a really neat way to deliver a weapon payload to the bad guys inside deep bunkers etc so yeah this is a major flashback and so boyd was dealing with his powers and eventually strad actually found him so this is what strad strad apologizes saying boyd was testing his guts to see if he would fight back peter saw he was changing yeah he was changing for because he actually fought back yeah so he said man i am changing strad wanted to take spider-man under his wing out of oh yeah this is what strat said in the script out of five billion people they are the special ones not freaks but masters each created by a fluke of technology it is some new form of evolution so peter gets to see strat's mansion he sees the artwork and also strat actually is stroking some eels and lots of other stuff happened too so Strat thinks Spider-Man costume is juvenile and wants to see under the mask and Peter refuses. Strat has been explaining stuff throughout all this. Yeah, basically he's basically the bad guy. I kind of saw he was technically Kingpin mixed with Electro. That's what I kind of saw. Which technically you could say that happened in Ultimate Universe except... You got Kingpin and Electro was his right hand man, even though we have no idea how Electro became Electro in the Ultimate Universe. So anyway, Spider-Man is getting seduced by Cordelia and saying that territory and lots of Cordelia's can be yours. That's what Strad actually promised him. So Strad actually showed that he can power a light bulb. Of course, Spider-Man declines. He realizes that Strad is a crook and then all of a sudden, Strad blasts him. Now you have Spider-Man versus Electro, round one. So Electro tries to unmask him, but Peter fights back, kind of like what happened to Miles Morales in issue eight. So <laughs> Strad tries to hit Spider-Man, but he keeps failing at target practice. So Spidey thinks and shorts out Electro. Yeah, so he basically pushed the tank of eels down with his webbing and causing Electro to short. Spider-Man dodges Sandman, and so yeah, Sandman tried to do it, and he escapes. Then Strad actually decides to use some of the webbing that he left behind and test it. But first he tests it by trying to pull on it. Later on, he actually gets tests on it. So Strad decides to do this. He decides to begin a campaign to win over Spider-Man. He first buys the TV station and gives J. Jonah Jameson an unlimited budget to bash Spider-Man. And this is the first time ever the F word was mentioned. This is the fourth cuss word, the first time they said F word. He even gets thugs to dress up as, dress up in knockoff Spider-Man costumes and rob stores, beat people up, push down old ladies. There is a there is a lot of sighting of Spider-Man, and they're all negative. So his costume was destroyed during that confrontation between Electro and Sandman. But we find out that there are stores selling Spider-Man costumes for 120 bucks. <laughs> 120 bucks. So on that day, he decided to actually buy one. So yeah, he actually bought a store brand Spider-Man costume. And he said it was even better than the one that he had on. So yeah, he actually wears that costume now. So he got sick and he eventually... <laughs> so he got sick. This happened in Amazing Spider-Man 2, but it gets worse. He actually hurls. And this is what the black kid... Yeah, he actually landed on a black kid's roof. And here is what happens. Here's what the kid says. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Spider-Man. Sup, man. And Spider-Man says, I've got the flu. And the kid says, hey, yeah. So going round, man. Oh, something's going round. And then the kid goes back in. And his mom asks, who are you talking to? And the kid says, Spider-Man got the flu, ma. Yeah, Spider-Man got the flu, mama. 
he's puking on the fire escape. Uh, here's what the mom says, and I'm not going to repeat the cuss words, so you can insert the cuss words if you wish. But it's the A word and the S word, if you're wondering. Well, tell him, well, tell him to Spidey, what? That's, yeah, it looks like, yeah, some of the script actually has some misspellings or whatever. Well, you tell Spider-Man his A on over to the next building and throw up there. Shh. It's bad enough with the winos in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> A word and S word. Totaling seven cuss words so far in the movie. From the bad press Spider-Man has worn. Crime is getting worse. Aunt May needs medical and he needs, she needs surgery actually. And the bills are piling up. He's getting tempted to take the drug dealer's money. Also, there's something dealing with the World Trade Center. So he actually did take the money. And he threw it in the neighborhood. I think that's what happened. I think he actually took the money that the drug dealers had. And instead of keeping it all to himself, he actually threw all the money in the neighborhood on the streets. So, Strad is tracking sights on him in the meantime. So he's looking for Spider-Man's house and he has lots of minions who are out there looking, trying to see where Spider-Man lives. So MJ gets to be on TV and she talks about her encounter with Spider-Man and she actually stands up to him. So what happens is that she goes to her private spot and Spider-Man visits. She kisses him as agreement to go for a surprise and they go to the Brooklyn Bridge. And there's some more web slinging doing stuff like that. And then they get, reach the bridge tower. And then this is where it gets a bit weird. I mean, if this was like MTV or whatever, you know, this is where it kind of gets weird. But anyways, this is what happens. Spider-Man gives her a spider lesson. And I said, this is a stupid scene. So he's being very seductive, moving his hips around and stuff like that. He removes his mask and kisses her. Her eyes are actually closed during this whole entire time. And they had sex. But, there's a but, it fades into black before anything was even seen. So, yeah, it just fades into black, meaning, I guess for the comic book cast, the one that they read, they saw something sex. They saw something that was sex. In this version, it was more the fact of they showed that he lifted up her skirt and there was no, there was nothing about the whole, he pulled down his Spider-Man pants. It wasn't anything like that. All it was was that they were just talking about the skirts and he moved the skirts up and stuff like that and then fade into black. So MJ the next day, she is in a happy mood. Her friends say how she is becoming a nerd like Peter and... She talks to him and she actually said the S word. This is the sixth time the S word was spoken. Eight cuss words in all now. And now she's more confident. So here is Strad and Boyd actually got a videotape of Spider-Man and MJ kissing. So Boyd follows her. MJ is thought as Spider-Man's main squeeze. Kind of like what happened with Strad and Cordelia. Sandman kidnap MJ, chloroform style, and now Strad has a prisoner. So Peter is looking for MJ and figured out what happened. Boy sent a doctor tape to the people, making the people think Spider-Man took her. So Spider-Man comes to the rescue. He arrives in Strad's mansion in Midtown. Yeah, he lives in Midtown, by the way. Cordelia is dead. He kissed her for one last time and didn't revive her, so now she is truly dead. Strat left a message on a VCR. <laughs> yeah, VCR. So, yeah, you know it's 90s because VCR. So he tells him to meet him on top of the World Trade Center. Yes, again, World Trade Center is used. Spider-Man was set up, actually. The SWAT team sees him with the body of Cordelia. And he escapes, but he still has to escape. So he escaped out of the house, the mansion, but now they're on a run. Now he's on a run. And a helicopter actually cut off his web. 
And then you have a major action scene with the SWAT team and the police officers. Will it rival what happened in Amazing Spider-Man? Well, notice the fact that in Amazing Spider-Man, all there was was just that little scrimmage. And yeah, it's like, that wasn't that much. This actually makes it seem like that scene can be put to shame. That scene can still be put to shame. And it's on TV that is a Spider-Man manhunt. Spider-Man lost the cops and he made it on top of the World Trade Center. So he is making it up there. Yeah, he is going very, very fast and he crashes right into the observation deck. Strad has MJ and he admits he was using her to get him here. MJ goes to Peter and Strad just talks. Yeah, another evil speech. And here is his speech because I think I have to mention what he says. Think about it. You can't save the world. Why? Because you can't save people from themselves. From their own brutal and vinyl natures. You're either a predator of prey in this world, a killer or a victim. People are by nature violent, stupid, confused, and greedy. Why waste your gift on the ungrateful masses who would love to see your mask ripped off and see you drag through the slime. The only thing they love more than a hero is to see that the hero fall, fail. Oh, see the hero fail, fall, screw up. Now, let me stop right here and say, does that not sound like the Green Goblin speech? Does that not sound like that's a piece of the Green Goblin speech we heard in Spider-Man? That is unbelievable. They even took the somewhat best part of Spider-Man and actually got it from this movie. And notice the fact that his speech is very well done. I mean, yeah, his evil speeches are very well done. It's not like crayons, coloring books, duckies and bunnies. This is actually straight up someone put thought into this movie. Unlike Amazing Spider-Man. Ouch. And Amazing Spider-Man 3. Ouch. Anyways, to see him exposed in a scandal, arrested with his pants down, caught with his hands in the till, you know why? It lets them feel better about their own miserable lives. And he continues to talk even more. Slowly getting closer to touch Peter as if caring for him. And then it's like, uh-oh, Stan is revealing that the bracelets that he have, the web shooters in quotations he has, are fake. So he actually got the web analyzed and it, it turns out that it's real spider silk. So he breaks them off and reveals the spinnerets or the spinners that's coming out. MJ is shocked and then there's even more talk from Strand. I guess it would kind of be a little bit boring the fact that he's just continuing to talk like this. But anyways, he says this. The point is you are not a hero. You are a spider. It's something you don't have a choice in. And spiders are predators. They kill to live. They kill to live. They are not hampered by humanitarian ideals or impeded in their lethal efficiency by delusions of morality. They are pure, powerful, as God made them. There are no merciful spiders. There are no vegetarian spiders. It is now time for you to face and accept your true nature. So we got even more stuff. Strad tries to make him join him by persuading him. Boyd reveals there's a tarp of money. Six foot tall, eight foot long. And <laughs> MJ guesses thousand, but it turns out that right there on the tarp is 250 million dollars. My God. Spider-Man talks about the drug money he took. He talks about his purpose, about his purpose to stop those who need to be stopped. MJ is grabbed by Strad and he shocks her. Also kisses her. Oh boy. And he also slaps her. This is the third time of female abuse. And there is the S talk. So there's seven times he says 
seven times in the movie that the S word is said, nine cuss words in all. Then he kisses again. He kisses her again. So Sandman holds Spider-Man while Electro is electrocuting her. Yeah, so Sandman turns into stalks and is now, yeah, stone. And he tries his hard to break free, but he can't help but seeing Electro shocking MJ. So MJ is now dead and Spider-Man cusses. And this is the first time ever we get the MF word. First time, 10 cuss words in all. Strad is trying to make Spider-Man a killer. And he revives MJ. Yeah. Now Strad revives MJ. Spider-Man webs MJ away and frees himself from Sandman. He dodges a blast and tackles MJ, getting them both out of there. Yeah, Sandman reforms because, well, he got shredded into lots of sand. So he's now reforming himself. Electro is blasting in anger. Spider-Man gets MJ to run to freedom down a stairwell, and she says she loves him. Sandman and Electro goes for him. Electro makes a field and wrecks the microwave tower. Well, since the World Trade Center is gone, I have no idea what that is, so whatever. And then Sandman actually finds Spidey, and now it's the final battle. Lots of stuff happens. Yeah, I actually need to re read that because i got like so tired that the battle was just so kind of boring so there's going to be another video that actually talks about the final battle but anyways lots of stuff happened lots of stuff happened anyways strad is fatally injured and strad actually for the first time ever pulled off his mask and he asked peter's his name and peter actually told his name and he's like <laughs> unbelievable and strad dies money is flying everywhere and of course that night changed peter and mj forever peter is now all bruised up and <laughs> the, the my gosh what peter says is that he was riding a moped and he got bruised and that's how he got bruised up notice the fact that the idea of moped that was in spider-man 2 and 3 as for MJ, MJ is now alone. She doesn't really have friends. She's now actually acting like her normal self for the first time ever. But anyways, MJ makes the grade and wants to go to college, med school. MJ thanks Peter with a kiss saying, she says it's familiar. It's a familiar kiss. So Peter told her to close her eyes and in his Spider-Man voice says, yeah, <laughs> He kisses, so MJ kisses him for a long time, and her friends are totally shocked. This is what happened. This is what happened. MJ says, my God, Peter, are you really him? I mean, and Peter just said, shh. So Peter monologues, and the kiss continues. Flash is mad and takes Peter away for a bit. Oh my goodness, really? So Flash does a roundhouse kick. He misses and hits a brick wall. Then Peter trips him <laughs> while tries while Flash tries to punch him. Then Peter helps him up. Flash charges again and hurt is hurt due to webs being on his jacket to a railing. So Spider-Man ends the movie and there's different colleges. Yeah, they both go in different colleges and MJ is getting better. In her grades while Peter on the other hand is spider-man so there you go everyone this is the whole entire script from spider-man 1994 so this movie and all oh yeah notice 10 cuss words <laughs> 10 cuss words they had a few innuendo stuff going on but other than that I would say for a 1990s movie it would make a decent fit. The only messed up part is just the webbing and stuff. It's the fact that you got to know that when it comes to the 90s, they don't really have the webbing and effects as they do nowadays. So it would be kind of horrible to watch on a Spider-Man sequence. And electricity might be horrible too. So it's only would have been good if you actually do it nowadays with nowadays effects. Other than that, 
I do have to say, in the 90s, it would have been quite bad. But the script itself, I would say the script is quite good. The script actually would have made a decent movie. I would have to say so. So this is the whole entire script. I hope you guys actually took a kick out of it or stayed all the way to the end. I will eventually do a video on what happens the final battle because I had to skip that. Again, like I said, it took me like at least three to five hours to finish this whole entire script. As for the development of Peter, I think that was kind of cool. That was something that Amazing Spider-Man was missing. And again, yes, I do have to say, if this was a Spider-Man movie, notice the fact that yet again, they went to college, they graduated from high school, but it did take place in high school. Unlike the, in Spider-Man Sam Raimi's version, it went into high school and then cut into college years. As for Amazing Spider-Man, they, they promised that it would be in high school completely. But in the second movie, they already had him graduating. So they kind of lied on that one. Anyways, tell me what you guys think about this. I'm webbing out. Peace.